Hello! Today we're continuing our look at Final Fantasy XVI's standout characters with an exploration of Cid Telemon. Now, there are a few characters that really stand out in Final Fantasy XVI as instant, endearing fan favourites, whether that's Clive himself, his companion Torgal, the lovable Gav, or of course, the noble prince Dion. But for many, the real jewel in the crown of Final Fantasy XVI is the man who ushers the contemporary Clive into the central arc of the story, which is Cid. And jumping right in, uh, I think there's a few reasons for this, and there's a few reasons uh, for Cid being so popular. Some of these being particular to Final Fantasy XVI and the characterization of this particular Cid character, and other aspects of him that are more broadly applicable to the monomythic structures of many Final Fantasy games. Because it's prudent to note that Cid very much fits into the mould of this elder guide or mentor figure that features in many games, many fantasy stories, who tends to usher our hero out of their everyday existence and into the first act of their journey. And traditionally, Final Fantasy writers have always done pretty well with crafting this particular archetypal character and their relationship to the central hero, whether that's the fatherly but flawed Sid Kramer in Final Fantasy VIII, who turns out to be quite an overly sentimental character, you know, so quite in contrast with our hero Squall. Or, of course, Orin from Final Fantasy X, who to this day ranks among many uh, as one of the best mentor figures, and indeed Final Fantasy characters uh, of, of all time. So, Sid Telemon slots neatly into this mould, and actually, I think, draws some comparisons with Orin from Final Fantasy X, because... Not only do they both serve to elevate and guide our hero, but they also have their own particular agenda and perspective of the world that is eventually instilled in our hero as well. So with Orin, he wants to end the cycle of summoners and the pilgrimage, and also gain some personal redemption, or indeed we could say revenge, against the institution of Yevon. And Sid Telemon, for his part, wants to destroy the Mother Crystals, liberate the bearers of Valisthea, who are treated as outcasts, and for all intents and purposes, like Orin, Sid wants to transform society into something that he perceives as better. And as he states in the game, he is fighting for choice, uh, and a place where people, and particularly the bearers, can die on their own terms. On a more personal level, Sid is a very well-written character, I think, and he strays between that sincere world-changing agenda that I've just mentioned, to one of pithy humour on an almost scene-by-scene -scene basis, and sometimes all at once. And for example, there's something amusing about how early on in the game he's relaying a lot of important kind of plot information to Clive about the icons and stuff like that. This is where we learn that there's only supposed to be one icon of fire and how the dominants are made and so on. But all the while that he's doing this, uh, if we are paying attention to him, he's just walking around pickpocketing dead soldiers. And I think Clive even states to him what will happen when people come across these bodies, and he says they are, they are going to be disappointed, which is brilliant. And even upon meeting him in this very first scene, after we've had this very pivotal betrayal of our scout comrades uh, as Clive, we've just reunited with Jill, who we haven't seen since childhood. And while all this dramatic stuff is going on, Sid simply emerges out of a cloud of dust and says, come on then, and, and beckons Clive to follow him. So I really enjoyed this humorous, piratesque angle for Sid that very much contributes and, and fleshes out his character. And it really flipped the script with similar characters like Orin, because where the latter is quite stoic and sincere, and he contrasts quite strongly with Tidus, who is, you know, the optimistic goofball. In Final Fantasy XVI, they made Sid the very laid-back, optimistic sort of character, and our hero Clive, by contrast, is the stoic hero who is consumed by the need for revenge uh, early on in the game. So it was a great pair of contrasting characters to bring together, I think. And Sid's nurturing of Clive, which really becomes apparent later in the game, when after Sid's gone, Clive does start adopting these pithy remarks and elements of Sid's humour. So I really enjoyed that and how they sort of passed the torch, you know, Sid passed the torch onto Clive in more ways than one. It wasn't just his worldview, but it was these particular personality traits as well. Beyond this, on a personal level, Sid also has his own, I suppose we could say haunted past, but not quite uh, his origin story. 
which emerges out of these incidental run-ins with Benedicta. And I discussed Benedicta in a recent episode and how this pans out from her perspective. But more generally, it makes Sid all the more interesting because he has these three tiers of involvement in the story, which is this personal origin story concerning himself, Benedicta, Barnabas and Walud, his involvement in Clive's story, which is ushering Clive out of this vengeful demeanour, educating him on the icons and setting him up on this path to break away from his fate. And then we have the third tier, which is the macro level story, which is his having brought together this band of motley heroes who make up the hideaway, such as Gav, such as Otto, even his extended relationships around the world, such as with Quentin, Isabel, and so on. So all of these broad array of characters that he wins over with his vision for a new world really builds up the kind of heroes of this game, if you like, and, and what kind of Clive inherits. And as I mentioned, you know, this does go on to Clive to complete this mission, liberate the bearers, and try to prevent the ongoing blight. So in a lot of ways, looked at this way, Sid really is the beating heart of Final Fantasy XVI, around which a lot of the events hinge or evolve out of, despite him personally featuring for less than half of the game. And in a story of emperors and knights and princes, he is this roguish, piratesque character who defends the weak, and might even be considered a, a Robin Hood-type character in how he brazenly usurps authority and the hierarchies of the realm, with a classic example being his repeated invasions of Sam Breck to try and get to the Mother Crystals. So I thought that was great. And as mentioned, uh, Sid does, of course, die in the game. He dies at the hands of Ultima in a pretty pivotal scene. So again, it's just with further evidence of his importance to the narrative, because this is the reveal of Ultima. It's the destruction of a Mother Crystal, and the, the first real overlap of Joshua and Clive's journey in this critical scenario. And it's here that Sid really passes the torch, almost literally in the way that he passes his icon powers to Clive in, in quite an emotive scene. Yet despite this, Sid does live on in the game in callbacks and cutscenes and optional dialogues and tomes that are found throughout the quest if we go looking for them, with one of my favourites being a flashback that shows Sid leading the denizens of the hideaway through a barren landscape, uh, which is now the site of his grave. And I suppose this aspect of, of the game and story is interesting to touch on, because while, yes, Sid does live on in Clive to some extent, a lot of his posthumous character development and backstory is optional. And one of the things that's been commented on as a criticism of Final Fantasy XVI, which I did address in my full review of the game, is a lack of characterization and built-in character development. And I also touched on this in the Benedicta episode. And I have been mulling this over a bit, because it keeps cropping up in, in comments and feedback and forums and so on. And I think what it is, in, in my opinion, is if we compare it with celebrated titles like Final Fantasy VI, Final Fantasy VII, and so on, in, in each of these games we, we have a central party of characters who, to some extent or another, has a scenario dedicated to them at some point in the game, you know, to their issues, which is built into the central story. And while sometimes there are only fleeting subplots, uh, we often have to muddle through an individual character's dilemma before we get back on track to the main story. So a classic example is visiting to Corel and going through Barrett Wallace's past, visiting Cosmo Canyon, going through Red 13's backstory, and so on. And this is a necessary means to continue the main quest. Or in instances such as Final Fantasy X, while we don't necessarily segue into, for example, Lulu uh, and her past as an entire questline, because we spend pretty much the entire adventure with our party, we learn about her, we learn about Waka and Kamari through dialogue, through reactions and observations along the way. So I think that's the main difference in Final Fantasy XVI, because so much of our secondary character appearances and stories, whether that's Jill or Sid or Gav or whatever, they are more often than not fleeting guest characters throughout the main quest. So they come and go, and they are fleshed out entirely by optional quests, optional dialogues, and optional tomes to further elaborate on, on their background and their origins, rather than kind of having to go through and learn about them as a part of the main quest. So I think that's where some of those criticisms might have come from. But as I say, kind of sedwaying now, I don't think that Sid 
suffers particularly much from this because he is so central to Clive's story and the main quest line, as we've already touched on. So moving finally on to Sid's design and general demeanour, uh, as touched on, he's very much this roguish pirate, which is reflected in his brilliant attire, his open collar, his loosely slung, slung swords, all of that sort of thing. And much like the equally revered Sid Highwind, I did enjoy that Final Fantasy XVI's version of Sid is a relentless chain smoker. And while I've questioned whether they will carry that over for Sid Highwind in the Final Fantasy VII remake because of its renewed target audience on, on a very kind of PG, PG rating, it was just further evidence that Final Fantasy XVI has cut loose from this trend towards PG wisty innocence and was really throwing the game into an unbridled adult arena. Beyond this, uh, we had Sid's role as Ramu, uh, the legacy lightning deity of Final Fantasy. And I touched on this topic slightly in my Benedicta and Dion episodes, but I do really like how they have paired up the icons with their respective characters in this game. It was clearly very considered about how the personality traits kind of react and, and sort of emote with these particular summons. And I feel that where Bahamut, the Dragon King, was brilliantly reflected in the nobility of Dion, and the harpy-like, tormented Garuda reflected very much ben Benedicta, Ramu, as he always has, conveys this sense of wisdom, but also threat and danger. And I think it worked really well with the reactionary nature of Sid and the way it was utilised in the game, where Sid would casually conjure lightning bolts to just to finish off an enemies like they were nothing. I think it worked really well. Another standout aspect of Sid is, of course, the voice acting. And the general consensus here, although I have seen one or two who found it jarring, um, I think the voice work across this game is pretty strong, and I personally really like uh, Ralph Innocent's work here. Although, if like me, you are British and of a certain age, so we're around for the original TV series of The Office, you will, on some level, forever associate Innocent's distinctive voice with the insufferable sales rep character of Chris Finch in The Office. So it did take me a while to get into the groove of Sid being Sid, with this gravelly, deep tone rather than the character of Finchy in The Office. But overall, I, I loved it. But perhaps more importantly than the voice work, as a contributing factor to Sid's character, and something I really want to touch on, is the soundtrack and the audio aspect of Sid that often accompanies him. Now, character themes are arguably a relic of bygone times, where, in the absence of voice acting and body language in Final Fantasy games, we had Nobu Uematsu's beautiful themes that crafted a sense of a character and a mood. However, Final Fantasy XVI seems to have returned to this somewhat Uematsu-esque sort of character theme in a few instances, uh, which includes Sid's appearances in the game. And while I think the composition in question is actually called The Hideaway, because it, it does play in The Hideaway as well, from the first moment that Sid appears on screen, out of that dust plume, to his dying moments later in the game, this is the track that plays alongside him, and I think it perfectly captures a sense of who he is, because it's very playful and medieval sounding, but also very soft and sombre and sincere in a lot of ways, and I really like how it captures that idealism and the sentiment of his conversations, and the fact it also starts playing uh, generally before he's even spoken, so it tends to set the tone for what's coming next. Uh, so I love that, and, and it's one of my favourite tunes in the game. So that about wraps up my overview of the character of Sid, who, as I say, is a pivotal character in Final Fantasy XVI, but also, I think, seems like a strong contender for the hierarchy of Sids across the Final Fantasy anthology, with many, many fans citing him as the best rendition of Sid yet, where... Generally, I think the consensus is it's Sid Highwind for a lot of people, but it looks like Sid Telemon is giving him a tough competition there for the best Sid. So, very clear indicator, I think, of, of Final Fantasy XVI's emergent legacy in the series. If you got this far, thanks for listening, and I hope you enjoyed it. And feel free to drop a comment below. Let me know your thoughts on Sid. <laughs>